Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. I'm very excited to be part of it. Um, Anne actually had very deep interest in, in germ cell biology. I'm going to tell you one story today just to illustrate one particular aspect that um, she was involved in. And I think this, this was at the beginning of the um, some of the work on, on germ cell, uh, especially the molecular aspects. So actually Anne uh, chaired one of these meetings, Siva Foundation Symposium meetings in 1990. And so th this, this is a quote from that particular meeting. And she says that germ cells are most fascinating, deeply mysterious and form a thin tenuous link between generations. Of course, we know that um, one of the endpoints, the endpoint of the germ cell lineage is to make gametes, uh, eggs and sperm, which at fertilization uh, creates a totipotent zygote, which gives rise to a new organism, and in theory, endless generation. So this is, this is what germ cells is all about, is to create this very unique totipotent state. But before they get to this point, a lot of things have to happen. They have to um, start somewhere and go through many changes. Now, um, the parental genomes contribute uh, equivalent genetic information but they contribute in mammals, they contribute distinct epigenetic information. This is quite important point to keep in mind. And in mammals, both parental genomes are essential for development. Now, one of the questions that was of great interest to Anne was on the origin of the mammalian primordial germ cells. So here is a development of mouse embryo from fertilization up to day 8.5. And uh, there was quite a lot of debate about where these germ cells come from, and the original work was by Chi Coin, who found by uh, histochemical staining some cells which formed a cluster with the stain. And he predicted this might be germ cells. And Anne later on also did some work to show that there was this cluster around day 7.5, putative germ cells. Uh, the really good work was by Kirsty Lawson. She did clonal analysis and she tracked the formation of germ cells from this day 6.25, from this very proximal end of the epiblast. And she also then followed these cells and she came to the conclusion that there were probably between uh, 30 and 40 uh, founder primordial germ cells. So what we wanted to do actually was to, to really look at the molecular mechanism, the molecular basis, which confers a unique identity on these particular cells. We separate these cells from the somatic cells. And this is the work that we started to do in, in mid nineties, early to mid nineties. Now there were two people that were extremely important and that ensured success of this work. The first is Sheila Barton, an exceptionally talented embryologist. And the second person who joined my lab as a, as a new PhD, finishing just fin finishing his PhD from Kyoto, Mitinori Sayotu. So these two people were really quite central to the work. And I think that this experiment is really one of the crucial ones to my, in my opinion. And the third person was Anne McLaren. And just by chance, we joined the Garden Institute almost at around the same time in early 90s. And so Anne was around and, and she used to come to all our group meetings. And, and of course, 
her suggestions and criticisms are absolutely vital to the story that I'm going to tell you now. So don't have a lot of time, so just to go through some of the key aspects. So we knew that there was this cluster, P2 cluster of germ cells at, in, at gastrulation 7.5 day development. So the experimental design was to cut out a fragment of about 300 cells. And we assumed that there would be about 30 primordial germ cells in this cluster. And we wanted to look, find genes that were involved in this. And so this was all done by single cell analysis. Uh, we eventually had 83 single cell cDNAs. And we did this differential screen looking for separating out uh, somatic cells from germ cells. So we, we came to the conclusion, the conclusion that there were, we had cDNAs from 12 somatic cells and 10 primordial germ cells. And the screen worked, this was great. Um, and one of the first genes we found was the gene we call Stella. You can see it on the right hand side here, a tiny cluster that is marked by expression of this gene, Stella. And subsequently, it turned out that there are three genes that are essential for the identity of primordial germ cells. They are PRDM1, PRDM14, TFAP2C. And Liz Robertson was, uh, had done a lot of work as well in this area, and she was also found BLIP1 to be one of the crucial genes in the specification of primordial germ cells. So these three genes set aside this small group of cells as germ cells and give them this identity. And this actually opened up the whole field of mammalian germ cell biology. So if, for example, you can now use these, uh, this kind of markers, these reporter genes, to track uh, migration of germ cells from early development to the developing gonads. And the, the other thing that we started to do was to look at other aspects of the germ cell biology. So here are where the, the germ cells are formed here, 7.25. This is the cluster, they start migrating. And during this migration, they go through a very critical epigenetic resetting process. This is absolutely crucial for the eventual totipotent state. And uh, Petra Heikova was one of the key people who started this work in my lab. And there are many people who have contributed to this work. Uh, so this, so there, were, there was a lot of activity in this field. And then um, later on, as the gametes form, this initiation of this, what we call genomic imprinting, which I'd worked on before. And you eventually get um, a zygote and you get totipotency. So we were starting to understand quite a lot about uh, mammalian germline biology. The other thing that, of course, finding this kind of reporter made it possible also to ask whether we can take uh, pluripotent stem cells and see if we can make primordial germ cells from them. So this is one very early experiment by one of my rotation students, Magda Cosio, who, who did, made this, uh, what you call an embryo body. And you can see here, expression of Stella. So this kind of told us that it is possible to make primordial germ cells from uh, prepotent stem cells. Now the, 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 the next part of the work was then picked up by Mitunori when he went back to, to Kyoto. And he started to explore these uh, early primordial germ cells, which we could make from pluripotent stem cells. And amongst other things, uh, together with uh, Katsuhiko Hayashi, who was also in my lab at one point, they did a number of experiments. Principally, one of the key steps is taking this early primordial germ cells and reconstituting them with gonadal cells. And they indeed succeeded in making uh, oocytes and sperm. And this, this is a fabulous papers they published. So I think this kind of establishes the principle that you can take skin cells, you can reprogram them, make pluripotent stem cells, and you can make gametes. Now I have to say that this looks really straightforward, but the 
efficiency is extremely low. Most of these um, gametes, eggs, for example, are not uh, don't develop very well. So it's a very tiny fraction of it. So it's it's still quite a challenge. But I think in principle, it's possible to make these uh, germ cells from skin cells. So let's think about this, we can call free range eggs. Let's say we can make these um, gametes from skin cells. So what is the motivation for, me, for pursuing this research? And I think there are, there are four key points to my mind. I think the first is that this would allow us to investigate the biology of what Anne called deeply mysterious germ cells, especially in humans, which are the germ cells in humans are not accessible. Uh, there are other aspects like transgenerational genetic and epigenetic inheritance and the impact of environment, particularly on the epigenetic modifications and how this could have, it, have an influence on germ cell development. The third aspect is that these gametes could allow us to explore early human development, infertility, testing precision of germline gene editing. And to my mind, one of the really key aspects, uh, which I think we should think about, is how this technology can help rescue of endangered mammals. So just to take you through the study of early development, let's say we can make these uh, kind of gametes from reprogrammed skin cells, we can try different uh, gene editing techniques on, on these cells and then follow their development through uh, formation of zygote blastocyst and early uh, perimplantation development. We can also make uh, embryonic stem cells. We can use these embryonic stem cells to differentiate into specific cell types, make organoids, and we can test for any kind of genome edits and, and the epigenome, and, and there could be epigenomic changes as well. So we can test whether there are this, uh, the epi, how, does the, how does these procedures affect the epigenome? And of course, we can repeat this cycle, taking now stem cells and making more gametes from that. So this would be a good model for asking all kinds of questions, particularly human, uh, where, where the where the, gamete, the embryos are less accessible. Now, the other aspects, which, which aspect that I mentioned is the rescue of endangered mammals. This is an example of this northern white rhino. There are only two left now in Kenya, in Ole Pejeta, in La Copia in Kenya. And there are indeed efforts now being made to see if it's possible to make uh, gametes from skin cells of that uh, that have been frozen in the Sa at San Diego frozen zoo by Oliver Ryder and his colleagues. So there are actually efforts being made to see if it's possible to make um, what we call uh, synthetic gametes to see if it might be possible to use them for the rescue of uh, endangered mammals. And I think if this works, this will be a very good outcome of all these research efforts that are ongoing. So I told you that at the very start of development, um, there's the segregation of early germ cells from Selma. And this is referred to sometimes as Weissman's barrier. And we know that skin cells or any other somatic cells cannot convert into primordial germ cells as a kind of a barrier once the germ cells are set aside. But we now know that we can reprogram these skin cells, make induced pluripotent stem cells, and we can use these induced pluripotent stem cells to make primordial germ cells. This step works quite well, both in mice and humans. And, and in principle, we can make sperm and eggs and make totipotent zygotes and potentially all organism. So, of course, mouse is not a human. Uh, and so, you know, the human, the work on human germline biology poses many further challenges, not to mention that the, there, is, there is evolutionary divergence between rodents and mammals, so, uh, rodents and, and um, humans. So that also adds more complexity. The timelines are much longer. 
And this is the aspect that uh, Narco Erie will talk about later on. So this is where I'll stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>